Correct. Thank you very much, Kiran. And welcome everybody to this Q&A webinar. So I'm really excited because this is the first part of running a training together with Anand. He was in my class a couple of years ago when I was with Scaled Agile and uh, one of, uh, of the great students and we always had great conversations, learnings. I learned a lot from him along the way and I'm really excited that we can do an implementing safe training together now. So this will be a lot of fun and this webinar is part of that journey to get some of your questions answered. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Michael Stump. I am a SAFE fellow and one of the first SPCTs. I was with Scaled Agile, the provider of SAFE, uh, did consulting, training, partner development, and really helped the global expansion. And I had the pleasure to be in India and work with India a lot. And that's also one of the reasons why I said I really want to do some training in, in India and work with some people in India. I really like the people, the culture. So I'm really excited to, to do another training. And hopefully when COVID is over, come over to India again to enjoy the food and meet people face to face. I do a lot of work with executives and uh, boards to really help them in, in changing their mindset and a lot of my work is outside of IT and software. So that's part of it. But I think the interesting part when you get the real results is really when you go outside software and IT. And you can see a kind, couple of information on the slide. You can reach out to me via LinkedIn as well, where you see more. But I don't want to take too much time away from our Q&A session because I've seen some really interesting questions and I'm sure, sure there will be more. So welcome and I'm excited and handing over to Anand. Thank you, Michael. As the saying goes, the role of the leader is to create the next leaders. And that's exactly what you've done, Michael. I still remember uh, being a student in your class in September, 2016, when I was I was looking at the way you're teaching and I was hoping one day I would be teaching the class, but I was not really, uh, I was not really sure that it will happen or not. But fortunately for me, uh, it's been an honor to, to share stage with you. But uh, whatever it is, uh, I'm still a student and you're still my teacher. Uh, quite a few of you know me, I'm based out of India and uh, I'm also in SPCT. And uh, I've really enjoyed teaching SAFE and implementing SAFE in last, uh, large organizations. Uh, it's been fantastic learning for me. Uh, every class I deliver, I really learn a lot of things from participants. And uh, I truly love my job. And this is my LinkedIn uh, URL. You can connect with me. Those of you who have not connected, feel free to connect with me. Uh, one of the challenges that uh, we have is that there are too many seminar webinars going on. So what I and Michael thought was instead of we talking, why don't we actually ask our participants a few questions and then we get started. So thank you very much for posting your questions. And as Kiran said, if there are any questions that you would like to ask, feel free to put it in the Q&A box and we will try to see if we can answer it. So let's do like this. I'm going to show the questions that you asked for Michael and I'm asked for me. So well, first question, Michael will take up the first question after he takes, then I'll take the second question. And that's how we'll try to answer all the questions. Okay, this is the first question for Michael. Michael, go ahead. So that's a, that's a challenging question just as the, at the beginning. And I'm not reading the question because you can uh, see it here, but it's really how do you help the change journey from project to product mindset? And what I really liked about that question, it is about the, the mindset in here. And that's what transformation is in general. That's why typically HR, the people department, they have those change people. They can help to change mindset and behavior. So how do, you, do, you, do I start? That's a really good question. 
because what is the starting point? So that there would be some follow up questions which you want to go deeper. What is your starting point? What is the current situation? What is the current thinking? So this is really important at the beginning to have this baseline have a, a current understanding. What are the pain points in the organization? And the first point overall would be my question or the question you would give to that organization, what is the problem you want to solve? Because it's not you want to change from project to product. You probably want to have time to market or employee engagement or whatever it is. But this question and having alignment around this question, what is the problem? How do we measure success? That's another interesting one, which will help to create alignment. And then what is the baseline will really make it a difference in there. So that's a good starting point to, to go to. Then what I would suggest, and this is something when you come to our training, we spend a lot of time on that. And it's based on leading change from John Cotter you really want to create the sense of urgency. That's why you want to understand the, the pain. What is the situation? You want to create a powerful guiding coalition. And I've seen in the question, you already have a few stakeholders that are interested to support you. So build this guiding coalition, create some alignment there. Be clear, step three, about the vision and strategy uh, you want to create and also communicate that vision and strategy so people know what, what you're expecting. And you really want to empower people to take some action. So you want to have small things people can do that they go get into that habit of that change. And this will create the short term wins, which will help to create more people. So Consolidating those wins is the next step, produce more wins. And then over time, you start to anchor this new approach in the culture. And that's the point which you should not underestimate. It's only part of the culture. It's, it's happening on a regular basis. So where do you start the journey? Try to understand the problem you want to solve. Try to understand the pain points. Try to understand the current situation and then really go from there, build a plan, find the right people to support you, find, define the bigger vision, and then start to execute small and create results. Okay, thanks, Michael. Let me move to the next question that I had. Challenge and coping up with current challenges, how do we keep motivated and uh, I think the question was something like, how do we keep our teams motivated and how do we keep ourselves motivated? What is the ground rule? A very, a very interesting question. Uh, first of all, all of us need to believe that uh, whether you like or not, gravity pulls you. Right? And gravity doesn't differentiate anybody. That's exactly what's going to happen to the post-COVID period. The post-COVID era will never be like the pre-COVID era. And if somebody in this yeah, in this room has a different opinion. Well, we can debate about it. Not not now, but later. Yeah, we can debate about it. But my my I believe that the post COVID era would never be the same as the pre COVID era. But the way we work changes, the way we interact would change, communicate would change, the commute would change. Uh, social distancing is going to be the norm. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> I'm sorry about it. And the business models are going to change. This is where all of us have to understand that change is more intensely coming in the post COVID times, which means to say that we have to be ready to adapt to a lot of changes than what we were supposed to do in the pre COVID era. And my strong feeling is that utilize this time to learn. Uh, folks in India, we are extremely lucky because we get so many books at a very cheap cost invest in your learning, invest in your knowledge growing, try to be an outlier when the era starts, the, the post COVID era starts, try to be an outlier. Only then the market will take you. If you're trying to be a fish, it's not going to happen. Right? 
one fish among one million fishes. Nobody is going to learn how to differentiate us. Create your own selling propositions. Now that's something that you need to do. Uh, as leaders, how do you motivate your team? I believe visioning is very important. I recently attended a class from uh, Dr. Pawan Soni, uh, an uh, IIM graduate who's done extensive research on innovation and, uh, and uh, creativity. And he gave us this wonderful story about what he had experienced about, uh, uh, about that goes something like this. When he was a part of Wipro, he said that he had to fly from Bangalore to Singapore along with his colleagues because one of the premier UK client who was in the oil and gas industry was supposed to come and give a presentation about their uh, the next next year's plan. And uh, they were expecting the VP to VP of their the customer's business VP to come and show some results, how they achieved it, and some projections for the next year. And for a shock of all of them, nothing of that happened. He just showed them a video. A video where an old lady is sitting and watching the television and suddenly she smells some gas. She picks up the phone, calls the call center and says that she smells an LPG leakage at her home. The call center agent on the other center, uh, the customer service agent on the other side, picks up the phone and says, please walk out of the ma'am, walk out of the room ma'am, don't touch anything, don't touch any electrical appliance as of now, just walk out. The lady walks out, stands about 300, 400 meters away from the place. And in a five minutes of time, there is a fire department personnel who comes there, looks at, the, uh, looks at what's happening there and tells the lady not to come to the house till he gives her a green signal. He goes to the house, fixes the problem in about 10 minutes, comes back and tells the lady that you're safe to go now. And then he says that the software that was, that when the lady called, the software uh, that connected the lady to the uh, to the call center agent was developed by Wipro. And this man started searching the nearest fire service department who could come and provide service immediately. He said that software was done by Wipro. And the guy comes with an instrument in the hand to detect the gas leakage and fix it, which was developed by Wipro. And he says, we are not in an oil and gas industry. We are in the business of saving lives. Do you want us to do you want us to join the next journey next year? And of course, there was a roaring yes. Now that's what is called setting a purpose for business. I think the only way we need to focus is always communicate a sense of purpose. Only when there is a sense of purpose in this COVID times, you can keep your teams motivated. And I think as one of the uh, one of the additional responsibilities of leaders are start developing an emotional connect with the people. Talk 15 minutes per day, allocate to talk to three different people. Five minutes per person, pick up the phone, have a one-on-one -on -one chat and say, how are you doing? If you need any help, just give me a call. That will probably change the rule. What is the ground rule? Purpose, communicate and provide a kind of psychological safety. I think that should, that should start the ball rolling and I'm sure you'll be able to you able to achieve what you want, though we are isolated, not even remote, we are isolated, we can achieve it. That was my uh, answer. Okay, uh, second question to you, Mike. Really, really nice answer, Anand, here with the purpose, and that's so important, and that's part of leadership, to provide this purpose and, and make that, that visible. So that makes a, a big difference in the engagements, and at the end, in the products you develop. So the next question is a little bit more technical. What is the difference between the solution intent and solution context? And there were some changes on the, on the big picture related to that. So I want to start first with the solution context, just to help people understand what this means. And when you see on my videos, you see me now writing here, so we have the solution and the solution is what are you building? So for example, you build a software, but where is this software running? And that's the solution context. So here around the solution, what is the environment that this solution is running in? Is it running on the cloud? 
is it running on a device like a, a Tesla, for example, in the car? So you want to know, and that's part of explaining as well, the thing we build, what is the environment it will work in? If you build a satellite, it will be out in the space. And this will define and influence several things that you will do and how you will do because maybe you don't have access to make a quick update uh, on the on the cloud you can do an, a, a quick update on the tesla you need to build different functionality to update if software is running on a satellite out in space you need different technology as well and, and build different features to make sure it's updated and maybe you want to test a little bit more that uh, you can always update because it would be really expensive if your software update fails and you can not uh, make any updates anymore. So interesting part. So I'm just moving here and you see the solution intent here to, on my side. So that's the solution and, or the solution and the solution context, sorry. This is really what we are building. Now, when we are moving up to the solution intent, this is basically describing what is the solution doing now and in future. So it describes the what and the how. What are the requirements you have in there? What are the designs? What are the tests? So it's a concept describing how does the solution look like at the moment currently and how does the solution look like in future and that could involve really the, the, the product itself that you are building the solution there but it could also involve is how does your setup look like and i'm just working with a company so they have several agile release trains but every train is set up slightly different so sometimes they struggle to find the similarities and part of solution intent can also be how do you create several instances of safe and document them and make them visible. That's especially interesting if you have a really large company, large organizations. Okay, which practices is a train using? What are alternative practices that are used? And you want to put that uh, in a documented way that others can learn from that. So that's the solution intent, current and future state, focusing on the what and the how. And the, the solution and the solution context is what is the environment the system will operate in or your solution. There's a follow up question like, why is it presented at the large solution? You see a lot of the things which are on the big picture don't only apply to a specific level. So it's really depending only, even if you have essential safe, you might use the solution intent with fixed and variable scope. So you most probably will use some of those elements, but not everything can be displayed in this small space. So that's one of the reasons Solution intent is typically used when you build really big system. Then it has even a higher priority, and that's what you have on the on the large solution level, where you have more compliance, model-based system engineering, set-based design. Doesn't mean that you can only use it if it's uh, part of a large solution. So if it helps you, you use it earlier, use it in essential safe. And I've seen a lot of organizations using that concept, and that's an idea also on an essential safe level. So uh, why is solution context move on a, move to essential safe now? I think more to also show one agile release train can create something that is uh, used in a different context. That's making it a little bit more prominent, the solution, the outcome as part of the essential safe level. Okay, thanks, Michael. Why continuous learning uh, culture competency is not shown in essential and large configuration big pictures, uh, which is visible at portfolio in full? 
whereas uh, continuous learning culture is done at team level only. Let's go back 10 to 12 years back in India. When there was a, when there was an ambulance that was coming back, coming honking behind. I still remember about 15 years back when I started driving a two wheeler in Bangalore, people were least bothered. They would say that, well, you know what? One of everyone have to die. If somebody is dying today, we can't help it. That was the attitude of people. But today, the traffic has gone maybe 50 times more than what it was 15 years back. Today, when there is an ambulance sound behind, invariably, I see a change in the behavior of every driver who starts looking at the mirror. They in fact get a bit panic to see how I can give space to this ambulance. Now, this kind of a change did not happen overnight. It's taken so many years to change. There has been a constant reinforcement about we giving more space and over a period of time this has changed. So that's the reason why you, if, you look at, if you look at the big picture, you really do not have that, that competency is not shown in essential and uh, essential level. Also, you also have to understand that, let's say we do safe. Uh, I was just talking to a company today and I was just interviewing some of their leadership teams and I was asking them, guys, are you doing safe? But they said, yeah, we are doing a kind of safe. I said, there's nothing like kind of safe. Either it is safe or not safe, as simple as that. So don't try to interpret that as trying to feel happy that you're doing something without doing it. I said, there's no, there's no kind of, it's a binary answer. Yes or no. And looking at the way they were answering, it's quite very evident to me that they're not even doing 1% of safe. The only thing that they're doing that 1% of safe is they're now focusing around the operational value streams. If you look at, if you look at the way they've organized, it's completely wrong. The way they are delivering is they don't do PR planning. That, that's it. That's a, that's a clear indication for me when I can write and sign in a piece of paper saying that you're not doing safe because that's some 10 essential elements of doing safe. It is so important that this cultural change comes only at the end. That doesn't mean that we have to, we have to look at that only at a team level or something. It's been represented there. For me, it's been represented there as a couple of reasons. Only when you get into portfolio, you really get an organization level change, which means to say that you can deliver business agility only if you deliver, if you get to the portfolio. And this, this is a cultural change. It doesn't happen overnight. So this has to be reinforced again, 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 and again, and again. That's why it's represented at that, at that level, at the portfolio level. It is not that we are not doing it at the team level, but we're just representing it only for a reason that a cultural change comes only after a time. Small changes become small habits, habits become patterns, patterns become culture. And this journey takes a lot of time. Hence, it's represented there, but it has got nothing to do. Uh, it's got nothing to do for, uh, doesn't mean that uh, essential safe level you should not have. Yes, it has. But when you really want to see it as a cultural change, you have to extend the transformation to the portfolio. Organizations should start telling that we have an ability to respond to change or follow a plan. And that is what we call strategy agility. Only then it's a change. Otherwise, it's a small symptom. A symptom cannot be a problem. Only continuously when you keep on seeing the same symptom again and again, or symptom could be a bit negative, but you see the same pattern again and again, which is reinforcing that we have changed. That essentially transforms into culture. Okay, okay hope I answered your question. Michael, really, next question. Really nice answer. So the next one is about large solution. So enterprises that have large solution configuration would most probably be at scale that requires portfolio management. I would not 100% agree with that. There can be organizations that build really large solutions and don't have a portfolio. 
they don't have value streams that are bundled and connected in a portfolio. And that's the reason why we have the, the different configurations in SAFE. So I'm, I'm showing my screen quickly here again. Let me stop so, it, Michael, so that you can share it. No, you, you can, when they click on, on my picture, it will okay. be, that, that should be okay. Sorry, okay. I think it's, you can just make my picture a little bit bigger that you have the speaker views, uh, move the slide to the side, and then you, you see it a little bit bigger. So in, in SAFE, you see, and Anand just talked about that, we have essential SAFE. That's the smallest uh, configuration and kind of the minimal things you need to do to, to call it SAFE as well, because that will create the value. It doesn't mean that you cannot have other uh, elements as part of your implementation. So that's part of the, the configuration. What does make sense for you? And then when you scale up, it, now if you build a really big system, maybe a government organization has a, a really big, large initiative, then you need the large solution and maybe you don't have a portfolio at that point of time. So enterprise, government, just build one, one big solution. And I've seen a, a couple of them. So then you don't use the portfolio. You use the portfolio when you have a set of value streams that deliver value to the customer. And in that portfolio, you have, whenever possible, you try to be as small as possible, right? So with one agile release train, only if you need to scale up, if you have more dependencies between the trains, uh, if you have suppliers included, that's when you use the large solution level as well as may be part of the of the portfolio but it's not a requirement that if you have a large solution that you need portfolio management the second part of the question is i don't think that the portfolio is necessary to have business agility you can have business agility in an organization that only have has essential safe that only has oh just going on on the the, the question do we need the portfolio management for business agility, and no, we don't. So the question is also about how can we move ahead and embrace LPM? And that's really a context specific question. What is the problem you have? How does your situation look like? Which elements of portfolio management will help you to achieve better benefits? So that's really context specific. That's probably a good question if you have the opportunity to join our class that we, we go in there and, and, and look a little bit detailed about that because that's really a conversation, uh, not just a, a quick answer on that question. Okay. Thank Over you, to you, Anand. Yeah, let's look at my next question. Why enterprise solution delivery competency is not applicable for portfolio configuration. Uh, I think uh, the, the interpretation is slightly wrong here. Uh, it's not that whether it is applicable or not. Uh, let's assume that you've got, you're trying to build a small website for a small restaurant to place some online orders. Maybe one scrum team is enough. One or two scrum teams is enough. They were trying to build a suite of applications to take care of a restaurant or the hotel business. Maybe one agile train, agile release train is enough. Right? So in the value stream that you have in your portfolio, end-to-end -end solution can be delivered with one agile release train. Now, you don't need a large solution layer, but if you really want to build an aircraft, build an aircraft in a true incremental iterative feedback with quick feedback loops, trying to do the true lean, lean portfolio management, applying the game of systems thinking, and of course, living agility. All of these things cannot be done by one agile release train. You need multiple streams of engineering groups to perform activities so that we can start building an aircraft in an iterative incremental way. Think about large cyber physical systems. Do you think that one team can deliver it? It's impossible. 
you need to have team of teams i would call it as multiple arts are required to deliver this large solution that's when you need a large solution layer so if you have a scenario where one of your development value streams think of microsoft for example they they could have a value stream called i'm just giving a hypothetical case right something like personal productivity tools portfolio that portfolio can have multiple value streams one value stream is delivering solution end to end for office 365 suite of applications the another one is doing a stand alone ms project the other one could be doing a stand alone ms teams now if you look at this picture office 365 definitely needs a large number of trains to do let's again take a hypothetical case where there is one train delivering uh, ms word solution there is one agile release train delivering excel there is one train delivering powerpoint and there could be one more train that is delivering platform services for all of these three the cloud enablement services for all these three solutions right now, those kind of large value streams require the enterprise solution delivery competency for small value streams which can be value value within a value stream if it can be realized by one agile release train we essentially don't need a large solution layer but when value within a value stream requires multiple agile release trains then you need a large solution layer well, essentially what are you doing in the large solution layer you do the same thing what you do in your in your art layer but with an abstraction if you can look at the three important roles you have a similar roles at the uh, at the large solution layer you have a pi planning at an art level you have something called a pre pi planning there what is the difference between pi planning pre pi planning well pre pi planning is a pi planning at an abstraction that's it so that's how we do so hence you don't see it's not that at a portfolio enterprise is not there well portfolio is a different competency we got lpm there but uh, at a large solution we always focus on uh, uh, on building large solutions so it's it's more like the execution part whereas portfolio is more like the the brain the strategy part of it right okay that was my answer to the question so let's go Perfect. back to michael here really nice one and i like the next one because that will create a new <laughs> skill for me can we predict the future uh i don't consider that as a core competency future prediction of of myself um uh, however what i can say and that's what you want to build in an organization you want to build a continuously learning and adapting organization i think that's that's basically a goal and when i work with organizations that's one of the things i'm looking at i'm leaving is continuous learning and evolving working or not does the pdca plan do check adjust cycle work because we all know that it's really hard to predict the future so environment is changing demand is changing so there's so many different things that that can happen that's why you need the skill and that's why in agility we say respond to change and that's why i can say when i look at uh safe for example i've been part of the organization a couple of years scale that child is always looking around what's going on what's new where are the demands listening to customers and what i can predict is that safe will evolve over time and support the demands of the customers and i think that's big part of the future and this is what you want to do as well in your organization you want to see what are the changes and i mentioned changes only happening faster post covid time even more so we need to continuously adjust find out what is the current demand adjust our product and solutions to the current market and that will allow every organization to be long term successful so that's the mindset you want to build and that's what i know about safe it's continuously learning listening to customers and then building tools training a framework or whatever will be necessary at that point of time to support organizations around the globe 
That's my prediction. <laughs> okay. So I'm done with my questions. Uh, oh, I have some more. Yeah, you have some more. Let me just look at that. Exactly. So the next one I have is, do you think SAVE is the new future of developing software and systems? How long do you think SAVE will be the market leader? So the second question, how long do I think SAFE will be the market leader? Difficult question because we don't, as I said, I'm not the best person in predicting the future, we'll see. But I know that SAFE is continuously adjusting and improving and that's why it provides so much value and that's why I'm, I'm excited to uh, teach SAFE classes and help organizations with that because that's what I really believe Agile mindset really helps organizations to develop software and systems, but not only. So I think it is a standard way of developing a really big system because it provides a lot of additional support and it's not predictive as a lot of people say. There are some things you should do because otherwise it doesn't make sense, but there is still a lot of flexibility and you need to know what are the different parts that you build together to, to be successful with the, the implementation. I also believe that it's not only software and system development. I believe it's running companies. The same principles apply to running companies. For example, at Scaled Agile, uh, when I was there, we run the whole organization with SAVE and that's still the case. There is, uh, BI planning, there is a portfolio management, so you can run the whole business with SAFE and with Agile, including sales, marketing, legal, uh, partner development in, in our case. So I strongly believe it's not only for software and sy uh, systems development, it can be applied in a much wider range, maybe need some rethinking of some of the ideas. How do you write user stories? How do you break down the work? Uh, and that's sometimes challenging, especially at the beginning, but it provides a lot of value because the same principles apply to things outside of software and systems development. So that was the second to last for me, and I hope we get some more in the Q&A part or chat afterwards. The last one I have on my list is how to convince leaders to change their mindset in adapting the new way of working. Working with leaders is interesting, and it's a great opportunity. I always try to understand where are they coming from? What's their current situation? What is their belief system? That goes back to my first question I, I got before about, oh, how do we change from project to product? What is the starting situation? What are the pain points of those leaders? How can we help them? Because that's the goal. We need to build some trust. We need to be able to help them. We need to be able to address some of the problems. So I try to find out what will keep them up at night? What, are, what is troubling them? What is the biggest problem I could help them to solve? And with that, I have some context that I can use the right language and have the, the right level of interaction. And then it's a lot about building trust. That's where I have my own experiences. I was a traditional manager and project manager and leader, and I was trained in a different way of working. I was trained and I practiced it and I was coached in that way. And then I had to change. And I remember how hard this change was for me, how I had to build trust in very small increments that I saw oh, this is actually working. Decentralized decision-making, I give some decisions away and it's working. I had to change my behavior and I'm still changing my behavior in communicating in a different way. What is the intent? What is the purpose 
to allow decentralized decision making. So that there's a lot of things where we need to help the leaders to make that change and build steps that have the right size. And I think that's a key point when you are a coach or a consultant, you need to know how fast you can go because if you are going too fast, you're losing the organization and the people. If you are going too slow, you're not making progress. So having that feeling of what is the right speed is absolutely essential. And that's especially important when you work with leaders. Push them enough, but also help them to get to the right speed. Create a sense of urgency Show quick wins. When you see behavior changing, make sure that this change will be visible. Because sometimes it's really small. It's just a, a show of or yeah, what words are used. And I had one engagement with an executive, and I was really I was a, a personal mentor to that executive, and we talked a lot about it. And I was sitting in the back of the room and, and I had some cards when he used old words and old behavior, I showed the red card in the back of the room. And if she started to use the new words and new thinking, I had the green card. So I was able to give him some, some advice while he was speaking and he was reflecting really quickly on, on this. So really try to build that trust. And a good starting point in my experience is train them, help them to understand what is the new principles and value or what are the new principles and values and what is the new approach help them give them some practices and that's part of the leading safe training a lot of principles and practices and then even more how do you apply it that they have a good understanding and they can lead and be a role model with the, that experience and I would also recommend if you work with some leaders, even try to get them into an implementing safe training because this is about the implementation and the, the really good leaders want to be there to know more about the change as well, that they can support the change and be part of the guiding coalitions. So also start small incrementally, understand their situation, build trust, build quick wins, and that's how you will continuously start to change the mindset. It will not happen overnight. It's a process, but it's really rewarding if you see those kind of steps. Okay. Thanks, Michael. There are two questions in the Q&A box. Uh, how Epic Hypothesis Statement is different from Lean Business Case and Portfolio Canvas? How applicability of all these three at the portfolio level? Is epic hypo hypothesis statement similar to the elevator pitch? Uh, let me take the first question and then you can answer the second question. Uh, I say you need to really understand lean portfolio management uh, to, to get into know the beauty of these words. Uh, portfolio canvas is if you take a camera and click your portfolio, what is that you see is your portfolio canvas. It talks about what are the solutions that you're building? Who are your customers? How are you delivering your solutions to customers? And how are these customers uh, giving feedback to you? What's the budget? What's the KPI? The second set of questions that the, the safe portfolio would ask is something like, who are the partners with whom we are working with? Key partners, the word key is very important there. Because if you want to write a partner, you can write 100 list of uh, partners for any large system that you are building. But no, key partners. What are the key business activities we are doing? What are the key resources that we are consuming? How are we spending money, which is your cost structure? How are you generating revenue, which is your revenue streams? That's what I said. Take a camera, click your, click your portfolio. That is what is your portfolio canvas. Conventionally, the world was very different. Right? The world was, I call it as the Frederick Taylor's world, where one knew exactly what is what I'm going to do in the next six months. 
that was our factory it was mass production and it was the same kind of job we were doing but today's world we we live in something called the butterfly effect i'm sure you would have heard about it a flap of a butterfly in india could trigger a tsunami in uh, in japan so people did not believe it but you but the covid 19 proved it one virus that is not visible to the naked eye has brought the global economy to its knee to its knees that's called a uh, butterfly effect a small startup can disrupt a large corporation that is another example of butterfly effect now how do you build organizations how do you build businesses how do you change your business models in this kind of world this is the fundamental difference between lean portfolio management and the conventional portfolio management life in your conventional portfolio management you would write a business case where you travel to the future 5 years from now open the door look at the world come back and say the world would be like this the world more or less would be like that in a in a butterfly effect world you can't even think about a quarter things would dramatically change now that is the difference between lean portfolio management and writing a business case in the lean portfolio management and trying to write an epic now what's an epic epic is a large idea an epic may work may not work coming up with an idea validating our idea with mvp minimum viable products and then pivoting or pursuing the direction that's all about the the concept of epics and to represent an epic we write something called an epic hypothesis statement so that's very different from your lean business case epic is only about that particular epic how does it mean what is the value we are delivering a lean business case that a business case i don't want to word the word lean business case we also write something called lean business case what is a lean business case it's a simple it's a simple steps to understand what are we trying to build how does it add value to my customers what are the cost estimates that i have to provide should i build the product buy the product and what is my implementation plan that is your lean business case right and how uh, how applicability to these three at portfolio level yeah what i explained is essentially the activities at the portfolio level is epic hypothesis statement similar to an elevator pitch well an elevator pitch you talk in 3 minutes but we can't write an epic hypothesis statement in 3 minutes it requires a lot of work to be done to come up with an epic hypothesis statement which can be understood in 3 minutes but you need a lot of time to create that 3 minute pitch i hope i answered the question that's a really good, good really good point and the elevator pitch is actually part of the epic hypothesis but it's just much more which you have in there uh that the outcomes leading indicators is one which i see is oftentimes underestimated so what are you expecting you don't want to have lagging indicators afterwards you want to have leading ones non functional requirements so you certainly want to go to the website and look at it and in the training we'll talk more about the the epic hypothesis statement and you will write one in the training So the next question I see on the list here what are the drawbacks of safe according to your experience what concept as prescribed in safe will not work in an organization for uh, my example my understanding is that lean budgeting is a challenge here uh there are a lot of concepts that are a challenge in in organization and one of the things about safe it's about change and it needs an organization and the people in the organization to change and that's a big part of work and one of the drawbacks is people can just use the, the new words of safe and push it over an old organization and i think that's a drawback but that's the same with every new approach with every framework you have so that the change is not really happening now not every concept is easy to introduce and some need to be slightly adjusted or you build a step approach so lean budgeting is maybe not the first thing you are doing maybe over time you can experiment and do a first lean budget element and then build the trust that we talked about before that oh this is actually working this is making budgeting much cheaper and it's more efficient as well so and more simple 
And then you see that message spreading in the CFO organizations to the boards because it's, it can save a lot of time if you do lean budgeting the, the right way. So it, it's really using the right concepts at the right time. And that's why the implementation or the change process, it's not just uh, one way straightforward. There are different ways. You need to understand the context, the situation. What do you do at what point of time? That's why experienced people like Anna and me are, are doing training and are working with organization because we learn from that as well and we can share our experience. And that's why just coming to an implementing safe class for four days, you will not be the expert after that. This is the start of your learning journey and then you will practice and you will learn more, you will read, you get more experience to guide, especially those waters where it's maybe a little bit more challenging to implement uh, lean budgeting. Or another thing I've just seen with an organization, they really struggled with assigning business value to team PI objectives which is an absolutely key concept and that's not an optional one because that creates alignment and helps with decentralized decision-making. That's now, how can we help? What are the steps we can do to position and explain the value of this practice of assigning business value to team PI objectives? So it's really different concepts, but it's very context specific, how to implement and what to do in which situation. Thanks, Michael. The last question that we have is, um, are safe assessments a good starting point to assess portfolio team maturity, the current state? Plan is to assess and see where the teams are in different states of Shu Hari. Absolutely. Uh, when you start doing a transformation, just imagine you just get into an organization and start driving the transformation. Do you think people are going to accept you? No way. First of all, you need to spend time to understand what are the pain points that they have. You, just, you should spend a lot of time to understand the key pain points and then assess where are they with respect to the pain points that they have said, with respect to some of the safe aspects or agility aspects, where are they? And then come up with a transformation plan. Exactly. Everything in life is shoo ha ri only. Also, uh, one important aspect with, with kind of measurements is that, uh, let me give you an example before I continue my uh, talk about it. We all know Mr. Uh, Raj, uh, Rajiv Bajaj, the current managing director of Bajaj Auto Limited. Now, he was doing yoga uh, and with uh, one of the most famous yoga gurus in Pune. And accidentally he sprained his back. He overdid and sprained his back. He was kind of bedridden for a month. He couldn't stand. He couldn't take a shower in the washroom for about standing for 10 minutes. And he was literally worried. He was afraid to go back to the yoga teacher because he knew that the yoga teacher would bend, do all kinds of exercise and the pain would shoot up. Instead, he went to a doctor. The doctor did a bit of a scan and said that you need a surgery to fix the problem. And he was a little worried about the surgery. So he again called his yoga teacher, the yoga teacher called him, they fixed a one-on-one -on -one appointment and then the yoga teacher spent two hours of focused time with him to kind of redo the exercise. After two hours, he felt a lot of relief and within two days, the pain had gone. Now, what I'm trying to say here is the, the way in which the transformation was planned. The, teach, the doctor wanted a function to be enabled Walking was the function. A function had to be enabled. The doctor wanted to change, fix the structure. So one way of transformation is structure to function. The other way of systemic transformation is enable a function. System will automatically take care of itself. If you can engage the right person who can teach you to do, do the right exercise, and that's exactly what safe talks. Start with essential safe, do small, and evolve over a period of time, the structural change, which is the culture comes into place. And this is a systemic treatment, whereas that was a symptomic treatment. So yes, assessments are important. 
had the teacher not spent two hours with that assessment the change would have not happened so assessment is important and taking the right doing the right exercises are important and then only it produces a better result otherwise you will not see results you see you see like that three bottle experiment that we saw in theory of constraints you do a lot of work but nothing comes out of the bottle in a flow we are struggling and that's the challenge most organizations have today they want the same wine in a they want a different wine in the same in a different bottle but they are trying to get the same wine in a different bottle it is not possible if you want a different wine you will have to get a different wine altogether create a new wine put it in the bottle you will get a different wine otherwise it's the same taste so how are we doing on time i think we are almost at the end of the session perfect uh, timing are there any questions no okay just want to kind of let you guys know that we uh, we have a class coming up uh, in uh, september september 8 to 13th uh, michael and i would facilitate the class as i said it's an honor for me to uh, share the stage with michael and uh, interested folks you can always uh, send a, a mail to anup contact him by phone or drop a mail and if you are a group of people obviously there is a provision of a group discount uh, any last minute questions i think we are already past the time any last minute questions okay if there are no questions i just want to close this uh, webinar with a couple of things that i wanted to tell if you look at a if you look at a english poem written in 1921 by a lady called myra brooks welsh she writes a poem and actually there is a story in the poem the poem goes will goes like this there is a house that is being auctioned in london and everything is being auctioned and finally the auctioneer sees a old violin sitting at the corner now it's completely dusty the strings are not in place and nobody would buy it but anyway he wanted to sell that as well so he asked for people to bid for it somebody bid it for 1 pound 1 pound and he started challenging that pound when when they were supposed to be sold it for 3 pounds uh, a an, an elderly man comes from the back takes the violin fixes the string and produces a beautiful music in that and then the violin is sold for 1000 pounds and then she writes a poem called the touch of the master's hand that's exactly what's going to happen from september 8 to 13 with michael coming in it's going to be the touch of the master's hand so if you are interested you can join the class but before we close one small thing that uh, that i was very inspired from the last couple of days trust the wait embrace the uncertainty I enjoy the beauty of coming when nothing is certain anything is possible so don't give up your positivity now this is the time where we have to invest on our careers invest on our learning and invest to be more positive you will get this presentation i think uh, kiran would send it to all the attendees if you are interested you can definitely get in touch with anu and we will promise that you will have a wonderful engagement of five days of, of six days in fact and you will have a unforgettable class thank you very much for your time uh, i thank all the participants i thank people who spent time writing questions for us uh, a special thanks to michael and thank you very much kiran for setting this up thank you have a wonderful day